customers come back, right? The winter hit us really hard and August was good and September was good and October was even kind of good. And just in terms of customer acquisition and then December, January, we're like the scariest things ever. We may have given up the, you know, throw it on the white flag if we started in January, like this is never gonna work. Welcome back inside of Trash Chatter. I'm your host, Victoria Conaway. And if you're an aspiring entrepreneur looking for a new business in your area, click on the link below and join the Sparkling Ben's family to start a trash bin cleaning service today. I'm pleased to be joined with Carter and Tegan from Bin Daddy out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Gentlemen, how are you? We're great. We're great. Glad yeah. to glad to be here. Yep. I will say we've never had a guest bring on their own mic, so we appreciate the commitment to being podcasters today. <laughs> Well, we had just uh, we had just purchased the mic to uh, record some social media videos for uh, some brand awareness, and it's a it's a it's a great use now. So it just the stars aligned, and, and here we are in full support. Awesome. Well, definitely need to get into some of the success you've had. Two trucks in less than six months, which is incredible. But want to go back to the beginning. I believe you and I, Carter, spoke in June of last year for the first time. But when did you guys stumble into trash bin cleaning and what's kind of your origin story as to how you got to be where you are today? Tegan and I, uh, this is, he's my brother-in-law. We had worked together in various things before. And at one point we had sworn off ever working together again because we were family for like, we just, we just can't do it. But we found ourselves uh, both from sales backgrounds and we were working in another position um, and it really, for, for me personally, it caused um, the position I was in, it caused me to have to travel a lot. And, and I worked a lot with one-time sales and, uh, and it was in the back of my mind that I would like to get into something that was more of a book of business and something that offered some residual um, dividend payout for my efforts. And I never really knew what it was. And I had actually been scrolling on TikTok and I saw, I saw TikTok, this is probably back in maybe June, I'm trying to remember when we first talked, but it was pretty quick. We had seen the TikTok and we were working. Um, we were working together at that point. We were running a sales team and, and I said, Hey, this is, this is a pretty, pretty cool idea. And we ran some rough numbers that, uh, as it panned out, we were nowhere close to those numbers. I was like, this is a no brainer. We're just going to rake it in. I'm saying like 500 clients a month, as long as we can just talk to enough people. Um, but off of our projections, I'm like, this is a really, really good idea. And from there, I talked to Tegan um, and we got our heads together. We called around a few different locations and then ended up with you guys at, at Sparkling Bands and definitely happy that, that we did. But that was that was our intro into um, into the industry because we were looking for something that could that we could put in effort and invest time and that we could receive something for years to come. What were some of those early mistakes you might have made? I know you said your projections maybe weren't what you expected them to be. What, but what were some of those learning curves you guys had to overcome as you started a new business? I think I, I, I could take this one. Um, you'll hear plenty of Carter's voice over the course of the uh, <laughs> But I think Carter kind of touched on it, but early on, our projections and what we anticipated um, <laughs> by way of customer acquisition, we were nowhere close. And that early on caused us to have to really adjust our, our budgeting and what, uh, how our finances were going to stretch over the, the first few months in the first year starting the business. So we had to make some major adjustments there. And also the avenues in which we went to bring in new customers. We, I think we were expecting a lot more of an early, um, I guess, reception from HOAs and property management companies. And we've just recently started to see some, some fruit from those efforts. Um, early on, it was a lot of word of mouth and working with the people who, who wanted to try the service and um, having them kind of spread the word for us. That, that's what worked better for us. And that's not what we expected initially. I like that you said that now you're starting to see maybe some of that effort come into fruition because we tell people all the time, like, you have to be repetitive with these folks. They might not agree with you at first, but how do you guys feel that persistence now you're, you know, six plus months into the business? has paid off and maybe opened some doors with other potential customers. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think it has. And I think we, now that we're in the industry, we have, you know, we're, we're part of a greater network of a lot of people that have had success. And one thing that I've heard um, as just a, a, a token of, 
of strength to those that are starting out was customers come back, right? Um, you, you know, the, the, the winter hit us really hard and August was good and September was good and October was even kind of good. And just in terms of customer acquisition and then December, January, were like the scariest things ever. And I'm like, oh my goodness, had, had we started, we, we may have given up the, you know, thrown on the white flag if we had started in January, like this is never going to work. And so I think we've overlooked um, how seasonal it can become and just the sales psychology of, you know, consumers when summer rolls around and when trash bins really start to stink. And so um, anyway, so it was a big scare for us as we started to lose customers or it just slowed down. And we have seen even since then people that we serviced back in August that have stuck with it. And we've seen people that are coming back around as it warms up. Um, and that's probably just a small window of what I think people that have been in the industry for years and years experience, because I think people do truly come around. And if you do a good job with brand awareness, then you are who they come back around to. Absolutely. It definitely can get seasonal. And I think you guys will see as we're approaching the spring into summer, it'll be your first full summer, which I think will be great for you guys uh, without giving away too much. Um, what some of things have you tried on the marketing side that you've found to work well and what hasn't worked well for you guys as you test out different methods? Yeah. You, you want to hit on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one that's worked really well, not a hundred percent of the time, but enough of the time to really make it worth it is, uh, we find a customer who really likes the service and, and maybe we offer them a discount on their next wash or, or even free of their next wash or two washes, whatever it may be to get them to post on their Facebook page in their neighborhood. And we run a little promotion to, to get people trying the service. One thing we've done is brought down the, the service minimum to allow people to try the service and not feel like they're locked into something. And I think that brings more people at least to a first time wash and then eventually a second time wash. Um, we, we try to push people to, to a quarterly package. That's what's worked best in our area. I think initially we planned on a lot of monthlies because we knew that sparkling bins in, in Miami, you guys have a mostly monthly customers. Um, same for John Michael in, in South Carolina, a lot of monthly customers. We have found quarterly fits best in, in our area. Um, so using the Facebook pages, having, having our customers post and, and spread the word that way has worked really well for us. Another question I wanted to ask about, you talked about brand awareness. Who came up with the name Bin Daddy and how'd you guys land on that? It's, it's, it's actually funny that you asked that and only because I can't remember who did. Was it you? I, I don't remember. I really don't. I, I want to take credit for it so bad because I think it's awesome. <laughs> and in fact... When we looked into the bin cleaning industry, I was like, this is brand new because we had never heard of it. And I was like, and then and looking into it, I'm like, oh crap, there's people that have been at this for years. We're actually kind of behind, but at the same time, we, we really weren't. There's so much more growth to, to come from the industry. But um, I remember being surprised. We went back and forth and we checked the availability with North Carolina Secretary of State. We're like, okay, we're, we're, we've got to be different than all of the guys that you know have a really basic name. I wanted to stand out. And so and we want to be the Kleenex of the bin cleaning industry, right? And when people think of bins, they're like, oh, like bin daddy, right? And so we checked on a few names that were taken. And then I think I thought it was Tegan. He doesn't yeah, remember. Well, he, I think the way it went is I, I brought the daddy portion. I think I maybe said like clean daddy or wash daddy. Um, and then I <laughs> think Card was the one who said bin daddy. So I'll take credit for the daddy. Um, which is, <laughs> and Carter can... Take the <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was it was going to be Bin Daddies because there's two of us, and just a reference to you know being the best of something, the daddy, the mother of all, and then a, a play on the uh, on just the family aspect, right? Because we we really wanted to emphasize that we are a locally owned business and that we do you know we we're. We, we are family. And so we have family involved, uh, even at this point in the business, we have a lot of family that works with us and, and helps. And so, um, you know, trying to play on the heartstrings of, uh, of, of, of customers to know that this is a family business. And so th that was, that was our approach. And we figured that Ben Daddy ruled off the tongue better than Ben Daddy's. So. I love it. And I think our entire team was happy when we see names that are unique, because unfortunately there's some that are pretty repetitive. So I like that you guys stand out and you touched on working with family or also family owned. What are some of the challenges with working with family? And then what are some of the benefits of having that? 
<laughs> well, as far as the challenges, you you can pretty much name it, right? And so it, it'd be, <laughs> it might be easier just to start with the benefits. I think I think trust goes a long way. It's it's nice to immediately, you know, feel like you can have some some trust with those that you, those that you work with, and and it doesn't need to be earned because depending on your family dynamics, you may not have trust for those people too. And then maybe we would absolutely not advise, you know, also having a business relationship. But I think if you have trust first and foremost, then that's, that's easy. But I think, um, I think the downfall is kind of twofold with that being a, you know, a dual edged sword that, um, it's also harder to make corrections and, and build, um, processes sometimes when it's individuals that you care for first. Um, and so that's what we found that's, it's difficult as we've tried to iron out processes and put things down on paper so that even ourselves that can kind of go by the seat of our pants and say, well, when a customer misses a wash and this is the way that we're billing them, what is protocol or they left, you know, they, their bins weren't left out. And from the start, we just said, well, however we feel is whatever we did. And as we involve family and we start to fill roles, we say, okay, well, there, there has to be something on paper that is what needs to be done. And so holding family accountable can kind of be difficult in, in that regard. Um, maybe more difficult because you're family first and you want to make sure that there's that love there. But um, I, I think if it's done right, it can still be executed well. Absolutely. It's it's something where unless you do it, you can't really explain it. So it's awesome to see you guys all coming together. And I do think people relate to that. I know people love to hear that we're family owned and it, and it adds to the product you're putting out and some of the practices that you'll deliver in terms of customer service and and loyalty as you know, we're in here inside of Trash Chatter. And if you're enjoying this episode and you want to subscribe for more, make sure you subscribe on the button below. And if you want to learn more about Bin Daddy North Carolina, their social and website links are in the description. We're here with Carter and Tegan. And I wanted to ask you both, what's been the reception in your area from customers when you approach them saying that you clean trash bins? It's been, it's been very mixed. Um, it really, I think, Overall, I would say it's been very uh, warm reception. Some people have heard of the service, but I would say that most we talk to probably 80%, uh, maybe upwards, have never heard of such a service. And those types of people there usually think, what a ridiculous service, I would never use this. And others think, oh, that's actually kind of a cool idea. And, and they're curious. And those are kind of the people we've had the most success with. Um, but overall, a lot of people think it's a good idea whether or not they think they would use it uh, differs. But even people who, you know, at the beginning, I remember talking to maybe a neighbor of someone, we were washing their bins, they came outside. They thought, oh, what a cool idea. I don't need it, but it is kind of cool. Here now, six months later, they're signed up for a, a quarterly plan, right? So people, the more they see it, the more they think about it, the more they open their trash bins and realize how disgusting they are and, and smelly, they think <clears throat> maybe, maybe I ought to give it a try. And I think that's where we're at in our area. That's awesome. Sometimes it does take some time to kind of break them into the idea because it's one thing I always tell people, it's one thing for folks to be like, it's an awesome idea. It's another thing for them to pay you to do it. So that yeah. takes some time. Definitely. Yeah. What would you guys say are some of the most surprising things you've found since you guys started last summer? Um, I don't know if this directly answers that question. And I think it may, it may just piggyback off of the last one, but I would say one thing that's surprising for us is I remember talking to John uh, Conway uh, earlier when we started and I was like, everyone is going to love this service. I mean, you just have to get the first wash done and, and they're going to stick. It's like, you could even offer it for free. And I remember John was like, you know, I wouldn't offer it for free. I would make sure that they're paying something for the service. Um, and what's interesting and what we found is because we are, we're, we're young, we're still in, in our youth, relatively speaking. Right. And so we have a lot of bandwidth per se in terms of what we're willing to dedicate to the business, right? And it, I, I'm not looking to go fishing 10 days out of the month. I'm not looking to, you know, retire yet. I've got, I've got many, many more years of really hard work. So, so we do work a lot. We work six days a week and we try to be as involved in even some of the things that um, really be, as owners, I know they don't want to be involved with. And so I think initially, we found that there were customers or just people that we would come in contact with when we're out in the neighborhood doing washes. And we're like, yeah, like, let's, let's get you guys signed up. Like, no, it's an interesting idea, but I don't think I want to do it for myself. And we found that there were certain individuals that wouldn't pay. It wasn't even a, a matter of question. Mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. it, it, there's not a price point for them. 
it's like, oh, well, can we do it for 20 or can we do it for 15? Or what is that price point that someone will jump on it? And we're talking, you know, very wealthy, very nice homes. And there are certain people that there is no price point because they have no value behind the service yet. And so I think that works as a really good initial filter that you do have to have a, but you have to pay something. You have to have a price point regardless of how aggressive you want to attack it. And I think we've done some things that are really, really aggressive. Um, but there has to be a price point because you filter out those that see no value in it. And the only way that you can instill a sense of value in those people that don't see it is, is through trickle marketing and through really just time and presence in the neighborhood. And they kind of come around on their own. And so I think, you know, that's something that we did wrong initially, something we were surprised by because I'm like, I'm willing to go as low as possible to do this first wash because I know I'm going to get you and I'm going to stick it out and this will be good, you know, down the road. And it really wasn't. We did a lot of washes for really cheap for people that didn't see the value and then like, it never really came around. So I think that was some wisdom that I probably looked past and was surprised by initially that you should have competitive pricing, but that you should also be at least patient enough to know that the value proposition for some individuals has to come on their own time, I would say. You know, Carter, we've been doing this show for over a year now, and I don't think anyone's given that advice, but I think that's an excellent point. And I, from experience, I can hear my dad 10 years ago being like, we can't do it for free because some people will just never call us back. So I like that you said that, and it, it does help as a filter, because why do you want to spend your time on someone that's not going to convert at the end of the day? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now that you guys have grown and you're getting into a busier season, is there anything you guys wish you did differently at the beginning? Or are you happy with where you're at and you learned from it? What's your take on that? And he can grab that mic real fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if, John, if John Conway listens to this, he's just going to be shaking his head. But I wish we had um, kept our service area a little bit smaller. And which would reassure it binds to do. And we, I mean, I think we probably started larger than, than we were advised, even in the beginning, um, which some of the areas we're servicing aren't that densely populated, um, a large area, but not a ton of homes. So, so we covered a few cities and felt good about it. But as we were marketing on Facebook, a lead would come through and we'd, we'd pull it up on Google, like, wow, that's a, that's a nice neighborhood. I, I'm certain we'll get more, uh, more people there. So we add a, a zip code to our service zone, right? Um, and we just did that enough times. I wish we had dialed it back a little bit because now we're in a situation where we've got some just outlying customers way out, nowhere near, and it, it kind of blows up our route sometimes. And uh, that's one of the challenges that we're trying to overcome right now, which we caused ourselves. And uh, looking back, I think that that's probably the biggest thing. He's definitely going to like those last back-to-back -back points. He's going to tell me that, you know, see, Victoria, I'm not crazy. I know some things, but it's true. And it's tempting because especially when you see homes, I mean, it happened to us yesterday. Somebody called that's further out east and our office admin was like, but there's a lot of other homes there. And we're like, we just, we just can't because it's just the gas paying somebody to go out there. It just, it all does add up and you do one, you keep doing it. Yeah. But, yes. And I think for anyone listening to reiterate that it, it requires a lot of discipline, like because we, we could hear things over and over and some people are brighter than others. I'm not one of them. I have to learn things myself. It didn't matter how many times I heard that. I said, no, we, we want a bigger market share. <laughs> We're, that doesn't apply to us. And it does, no matter who you are, unless you have infinite pockets and you're going to just let this roll for years and years. And I think it, then maybe that's your thing, right? But for 99.9% .9 of people, it requires so much discipline. And I think the benefit the benefit is twofold is one, you, you can have, you can be more profitable because you're, you're closer together. Um, and you start to build a client base faster because people are seeing you more often rather than seeing you more scarce. We, we see people that have serviced North Carolina since 2007, we saw another truck and been here since 2007. And I was like, Oh, 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 oh my goodness. We haven't even run into any customers of, of theirs, but we see them all over Charlotte and they cover just a really, really large area. And so I think people every once in a while seeing your truck versus when we focused in particular neighborhoods, because we had, we got so many calls because they saw our truck almost every other day. And so it's a really stark difference and it requires a lot of discipline to actually stick with it. Much like really anything in this, I think <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just easier said than done, right? If, if you stick to it, it's going to be super, super beneficial in, in that regard. And then the other half of that, I think 
is from a sales psychology, I think the customers, we would have people that would reach out to us and almost kind of demand things like, hey, if you do it for 20, I'm in, right? Or yeah, if why don't you just stop by when you're in the area? We kind of have people that, um, and I'm sure they mean no disrespect, but I think sometimes that's how it's perceived. It's like, hey, we have, a, we have an operating business. We can't just turn upside down for you. And I think to say to a customer, we don't service that area yet because it doesn't fit into our logistics. It's like, oh, wow, right? And I think that kind of, that kind of puts you back in control and really sets you up to work with them if you are going to do Facebook posts to get X amount of customers until you open up that area. I think it's a, a really strong regaining of control to have your boundaries and, and, and know where you're going to service and where you're not before you actually get into it. Because if you make those decisions on the fly, you will just add zip codes as we have done. I appreciate the transparency from both of you. You know, some people can feel it, but they won't come on a podcast and say, hey, we did this wrong. So I definitely appreciate that. And hopefully people that are listening, they can take advice from there. And I like your point about the clients that demand. Like we'll have people say, well, I'll pay you $100 if you come now. And I'm like, I might make you happy, but I'm going to upset another 100 people. So we can't just shift around our day because you want that. And like you said, it's about the phrasing too, because you want to have good customer service. But if you present it like that, it adds more professionalism to your business and more integrity behind trash bin cleaning. Before we let you guys go, and we appreciate you taking some time to help us out here on the podcast. I want to ask where you guys would like to see Bin Daddy in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, we, we've made projections. And I would say, and as Tegan said, the majority of the talking is going to be for me, and he's right. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to fill the time with you know, we've done this and we figured that out, but I think that's what these podcasts are, right? It's, it's sharing successes uh, and looking at what others have done. And I, I wish I had done, I wish I had done that before even purchasing the rig and done some more research. We were pretty gung ho and we had the rig and we're, then we started learning and that was a little back, backwards way to do it. But um, I would say in addition to that, we had talked about some of the successes that we had or things that we wish we had started earlier. I would say for areas that it is seasonal, I would spend your winters working through processes um, because it can take months to build processes to really get comfortable with your software. And I don't just mean the software that you use as your main CRM. We use we use a bunch of different methods. And, and Tegan, that's what he spearheads. That's that's not my expertise at all. But we have we have spreadsheets where we can say how many customers had the first wash but not the second. The second but not the third, the third, not the fourth. Um, you know, having a unique ID for different um, neighborhoods and actually building that out in Excel, he has, but there's a lot of different ways that you can do that is really on your own collecting data for what you experience because the data can be pretty valuable and it really paints a picture that, um, that the emotions really can't capture. And so sometimes we feel like, oh, if we have a few people cancel in one day, it's like, oh, everything's going to crap. And it's like, oh, actually, we're, we're right on track with what we, what we, with what we projected. And so um, I would say that's a big thing is, is, is gather data, gather all the data that you can. And so we do have projections and our projections go out as far as a year, but we haven't, we haven't projected out to five to 10 years. That would be a little bit more from the hip, but I would love five to 10 years, man, I would, I would love to have 15, 20 trucks. Um, you know, we, we really want to have a large area and, um, and I would love to cover all of Charlotte and to be the, the go-to trash bin guys that everyone thinks of and, um, and have a, a huge operation that probably involves more family and more family to help manage because it's gotten so daggum big is, is that's where I see it. Yeah. Yeah. I, very similarly. Um, it's hard to think about five years out because we're still in year one and I don't feel like we're out of the woods yet. We, we're on the right track, um, but I'm just focused on, on this year, this summer, and really hitting our goals and being on track to, to make it through and start releasing some profitable months. Uh, but in five years, I think it's the same goal, right? Just to just scale up larger. And I don't know how large I have dreams, but, uh, We'll see. I know multiple trucks and, and hopefully a lot of the Charlotte area, maybe a, a satellite branch somewhere. I don't want uh, I want big, big daddy to just keep growing and growing as, as large as we can. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing those bits of information as well as your loyalty to Sparkling Bins. We appreciate the feedback and the contributions you've given. 
Once again, Carter and Tegan, Bin Daddy, North Carolina, out of Charlotte. Thank you both for making some time today. Thank you. Once again, this is Trash Chatter, a podcast that's released once a month. And if you are an aspiring entrepreneur and want to sign up to find out about how to clean up your neighborhoods with your own trash bin cleaning service, please make sure to check out the link in the bio, as well as check out Bin Daddy North Carolina. They've got some great social media content as well as their website. Thank you all for tuning in to Trash Chatter, and we'll see you again next time.